Et puis, ça n'est pas que la France, et c'est d'ailleurs comme ça que nous allons commencer, avec euh, Madame Hélène Mardis. Uh, she is co-executive director of the Institute for Genomic Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital and professor of pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. So I'm going to give the floor to you, but before, just remind your conference still, which is Clinical Translation of Cancer Genomics, donc la, euh, la recherche clinique euh, en génomique euh, du cancer. Euh, et nous allons avoir, euh, bien sûr, une présentation avec slide. La particularité, c'est que pour des raisons techniques et pratiques, les orateurs vont rester assis devant leur ordinateur. Vous allez avoir les slides. Et si nous avons le temps, donc des questions réponses ensuite. It's up to you. Heather. Thank you very much, um, Fabrice. Can everyone hear me? Yes? OK. It's hard to tell if it's on. Yeah, c'est bon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. It's a great honor to be invited here to um, this uh, momentous occasion to celebrate the career and contributions of Pierre Tamborin and to um, present my keynote lecture on the clinical translation of cancer genomics. So the, the topics that I will uh, review today include a bit of background for cancer genomics, Uh, for the uninitiated, if there are any in the audience. Uh, an overview of where large-scale cancer genomics has brought us to this point in time when translation into clinical reality for cancer patients, as I'll try to illustrate, is definitely upon us. And I think it is imperative to pursue these um, large-scale studies and the information that they have provided us into the clinical care of cancer patients. So I'll illustrate that with some N of one studies, as I like to call them, individual <laughs> patient stories that illustrate how cancer genomics can play out in clinical reality for patients, and um, also talk about some of the newest areas where genomics is being applied, including the use and design of cancer vaccines in patients with advanced cancer. And then I'll finish with a few comments about my thoughts on the future prospects for genomic medicine. We have known for quite some time, even before DNA was known to be the hereditary unit in the cell, that changes in the DNA probably led to the onset of cancer. But this became very evident in the 1970s with work from the first cytogeneticists, such as Dr. Janet Rowley, who is shown here at her microscope, who began examining the chromosomes of cancer patients and established over time that there were reproducible patterns in patients with the same disease diagnosis, such as the translocation shown here between chromosomes 15 and 17, which forms a fusion gene that provides patients with the um, driving factors that cause acute promyelocytic leukemia. So what I'll talk about today is really the use of next generation sequencing instead of microscopy. I think of it as just a finer-tuned microscope that instead of looking at the entire chromosome, we can now break it down nucleotide by nucleotide and look at exquisite resolution at what has gone wrong in each and every cancer patient's genome. We owe a lot of what we know about this ability to sequence by next-generation sequencing methods to the Human Genome Project, um, which took place here in the United States and really internationally to provide this template of what uniquely makes us human. And during the time period of 1989 to 2003, I was very pleased to be a part of a very large international project that decoded the human genome and now gives us this keystone by which every genome can be decoded. We do this now using high throughput sequencing methodologies, including the use of sequencing instruments such as the one shown here. The one on your left would have been the one that we used to decode the human genome, mouse genome, chimpanzee, and other uh, model organism genomes that were studied to better understand our own genome, as I'll talk about today. But on the right, what we see is now the current power in just a short time frame of about 10 years or so where we've gone from requiring about $15 million dollars to sequence an entire human genome to requiring on the order of about $1,200 US dollars per genome on an instrument that is, that is able to decode about 16 human genomes in a fairly short time period, three to four days' time. So this magnificent ramp in our ability to decode human genomes 
I would argue, has really transformed biomedical inquiry. It has enabled us to move from the old ways, shown in the upper panel, using largely bacterial intermediates to clone out pieces of DNA, study them with independent um, molecular biology followed by DNA sequencing, to a new way that allows us to skip many of these intermediates, prepare DNA into libraries directly without the use of bacterial cloning, and decode the genome in a relatively short period of time by coupling together the molecular biology and detection that is required to produce the DNA sequencing data. Of course, nowadays, just producing the DNA sequencing data is not enough. We have to use the human genome as a template to really understand exactly what we are seeing. And this is done by basically using computational approaches that align these short read sequences to find their original place back on the human genome reference so that we can now go forward by comparing tumor DNA to the reference and normal DNA to the reference and then looking at the differences between those two to decode what is uniquely somatic and what is inherited or constitutional. And by doing this type of an approach, we can achieve this exquisite detail on each and every cancer patient's genome, understanding at the level of single nucleotides, large-scale events such as amplifications, deletions, and translocations, exactly that recipe that has caused cancer in that individual patient. I will also talk about today just briefly the use of RNA, that intermediate between DNA and proteins that can also add a huge amount of information, in many cases telling us exactly what's wrong, as I'll illustrate, without those clues being available from the DNA. And so it's this integration of DNA and RNA data that I will argue in the future is incredibly important to continue to pursue these types of studies in the clinical setting. <clears throat> we use this paradigm in our studies of cancer to begin thinking about, rather than focusing on individual genes in terms of what might be going wrong with each cancer patient, to instead just sequence the genome and allow it to tell us what had gone wrong in an unbiased fashion. And we were the first to do this in, in 2008 in an individual cancer patient with acute myeloid leukemia, comparing her bone marrow aspirate, the source of her tumor, to a piece of skin that had been removed to obtain that bone marrow aspirate. And in this comparison between the tumor and the normal, as I've described for you, using then very, very early versions of the Illumina technology with only 30 base pair read lengths, we were able to, for about $1 million US, arrive at a recipe for this patient's cancer, which totaled uh, mutations in 10 known genes. Um, two of these had been previously described in AML. We also found, as I'll talk about, in her normal genome, some predisposing mutations that um, give susceptibility to uh, cancer development. And this was done, as you may know, at a time when it was entirely foolish to do this kind of an experiment. It was way too expensive. It was um, a need to develop the bioinformatics, the computational comparisons that I've described to really tease out the difference between tumor and normal. But we went ahead and did this with private philanthropy, and we were able to demonstrate at that point in time that this indeed could be done. Now, as I've described for you, the cost of DNA sequencing has fallen tremendously over this even short time period. And so thankfully, it no longer costs a million dollars to decode a human genome because we wouldn't be doing so much of it as we are today. But this study really set the stage, I would argue, as did the efforts of many other laboratories to prove that use of next generation sequencing could begin to open up very large scale studies to understand those differences between tumor and normal genomes across tens of thousands of individuals. And indeed, you'll see from this chart that that is exactly what has transpired over the past six or seven years, um, where there are very large international efforts. Certainly in the United States, I was part of the Cancer Genome Atlas, um, which decoded about 10,000 cancer genomes across the major 
20 uh, tissue sites where cancer occurs in the human. I was also part of a very large consortium decoding pediatric cancer genomes, which I'll talk about t a bit today, um, with the money provided by the St. Jude uh, Research Hospital in Memphis, where we sequenced over 1,000 pediatric patient genomes, again, across the spectrum of pediatric cancer types. And so now we see this coalescence of information from all of these cancer genomes has begun to come together, and we are understanding more and more about cancer, including some things that are surprising us that we hadn't realized before. For example, cancer genes are shared across tissue sites. There's almost no examples left of individual genes that are only mutated in breast cancer or, or in colorectal cancer, for example. So we see the commonality of these genes being altered and being altered in a multitude of ways, not just simple point mutations, but deletions, amplifications, translocations, inversions, any way that you can modify the DNA, changes in methylation, even changes in terms of the histone packaging on, on histones, we are seeing these alterations occurring. And what this really means is that rather than focusing on individual genes when we do our analyses of individual cancer patients, we really need to abstract up to a higher level, which is looking at the cellular pathways that are being interrupted by virtue of these massive changes in DNA, or in some cases, even very, very simple changes, as I'll illustrate. So the time really, I would argue now, is correct to translate cancer genomics. One of the other surprises I'll just briefly talk about has been the increased information about changes to the constitutional DNA, our ability to inherit susceptibility to cancer. And this has been quite a surprise because initially it was thought that only about 5% of cancer patients had a susceptibility that they inherited or developed during um, their own uh, development in utero. But in fact, very, very large-scale studies now in adult patients, such as this one shown here, over 10,000 patients, are illustrating that our susceptibility to cancer is much higher than originally thought. This is true not only for adult cancer patients, but also now in pediatric cancer patients. Very, very large numbers, and this number is, again, on the order of 10 to 11% of pediatric cancer patients have a germline susceptibility. And so what this really means in aggregate is that we can't just consider the alterations to the somatic genome. We have to also consider the pathways that are affected by constitutional defects in the genome and consider this in a, as a complete whole, as the total story that is being told to us by the cancer genome. And we can see this in the analysis of shared germline and somatic cancer genes where you can look across the bottom and pick your favorite gene, perhaps, or one that you know most about in its context in cancer, and see quite readily that we see evidence in both somatic and constitutional defects in these genes. And so a holistic approach, I think, to integrate the germline and the somatic DNA is, is incredibly powerful. So let's talk a little bit about what has also been going on during this time period, which is an incredible increase in the number of drugs now, targeted therapies, much, more, much different than the conventional broad-spectrum chemotherapies that we're used to using in the clinics, where specific types of genes, in, in, in particular the proteins that they produce, are being targeted by drugs. And one of the first uh, stories in this um, case from our own work was an early study before the use of next generation sequencing with Dr. Harold Varmus, who at the time was directing the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. At that time, he and William Powell, who's now at Roche in Basel, um, were evaluating patients from a clinical trial of a new type of drug called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, or TKI. And in their lung cancer patients who were receiving this drug in the metastatic setting, they were seeing two things. One, patients with no response whatsoever to the drug, or two, patients with even advanced disease having their tumors completely disappear in a matter of a few days or weeks. 
And so in this small study, we actually looked at specific genes that were thought to be encoding proteins that would be inhibited by the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And indeed, what we found is illustrated here. We identified, along with two other groups um, at the same time, these specific mutations in the EGFR tyrosine kinase domain, some of them quite dramatic, as you can see. And in particular, we determined that about 80% of these patients that had a response, even with these very focused methods we were using at the time, actually had these modifications in epidermal growth factor receptor. In the clinic today, this is a gene that is commonly typed, along with several others, as we'll talk about, in the analysis of cancer patients with lung adenocarcinoma. And this graph really represents this transition in our understanding of cancer, where in the past, the small pie graph would have simply been the pathologist's designation of the cell type of origin for that cancer. Now, in the microcosm that is adenocarcinoma, which is most of lung cancer, we can see the front pie graph is actually illustrating to us the exquisite detail of different driver mutations in different genes that has been identified. And what this has led us to in the current setting for cancer care for patients with lung adenocarcinoma is the following. A biopsy may be taken from patients who are in need of treatment decisions. Some type of analysis will be done by a panel of genes using next generation sequencing to compare tumor to normal, as I've described. And based on what is found there, a number of possibilities emerge for that patient. If these EGFR mutations are indeed identified, one of several tyrosine kinase inhibitors may be chosen. And indeed, in the United States in 2015, for patients with first diagnosis lung adenocarcinoma and EGFR mutations, these drugs can now be used in the first line of care. So not waiting until the metastatic setting, but actually as patients are diagnosed. By comparison, we know that if EGFR and KRAS are found together, KRAS is always the stronger driver, and so these patients receive this former standard of care treatment, which is surgery followed by radiation. And then in the newest drivers, these fusion genes that have been identified, ALK, for example, by Hiromano in Japan, there are new drugs such as crizotinib and a second generation seritinib that can be prescribed for these patients in the metastatic setting. So what you see here is just one example of how things have changed dramatically based on these results that we've accrued over the past few years from large-scale cancer sequencing. Lung is just a great example because there are many drugs, many targeted therapies that are now available for these different alterations. But the real challenge for physicians and medical oncologists in particular is how do we make sense out of all of this? And indeed, how do we stay on top of all of the information? Because there's a deluge of clinical trials, drugs being tested, um, FDA approvals, et cetera. And so really, these challenges in some ways are brought on by the use of next generation sequencing because we can rapidly test many genes at the same time. We can get a very large amount of information, and now it's up to the individual pathologist and medical oncologist to work together to reduce this down into a useful set of facts for each and every patient. In this regard, and in this dilemma about um, interpreting clinical data, we have come up with several tools to help physicians, and I thought it might be of interest to illustrate these for you briefly. One of these tools is called CIVIC. This is Clinical Interpretations of Variants in Cancer. It's an online available web-based database that accumulates information and coalesces it from curation of the peer-reviewed literature. And so um, just over the past few years when we've built this database, it was reported recently in Nature Genetics, um, we've been able to accrue lots and lots of information about different tumor types, different variants and genes, and so on. And part of the way we're doing this, because it takes an army of people to accrue this much information, is we're actually crowdsourcing. So we are co-opting the efforts of professionals in the field, such as researchers, clinicians, and patient advocates, to contribute information into CIVIC as known uh, uh, curators or providers of information 
where they have actually their credentials and their names displayed so people know who have contributed the information. Importantly, because many of these efforts are quite new and patients indeed are receiving drugs in the clinic where they may have an unknown mutation in, in, in relation to the drug they're being treated with, we can actually have an open discussion about those clinical experiences that may lead to increasing the amount of information that others who are surveying this database on a routine day-to-day uh, -day basis can benefit from in their own treatment of patients. And so this is really the idea for the crowdsourcing is not just to take advantage of outside knowledge, but to accrue information faster into this database. Another database that we put together early on and has already been reported in a couple of literature articles is the drug gene interaction database. This would be the next step once you've identified the gene that you and the and the variant that you would really like to target. What are the gene what are the drugs that are available to treat the protein product of that gene? And so what I've provided here is just a brief example of how one mines information out of DGI. I've put in two genes for your information. They are ALK and MET. And I've set some of the parameters in terms of how many databases I want to query and what type of interaction I want to see. I've only selected inhibitors of these two genes. And so when I press the green button, I get a res results page that's shown here, illustrating some of the gene-drug inter interactions that are known. There are many more. I just showed a few here. And some of the databases that have reported back these interactions. And now to get more information, if I'm a physician who's interested, for example, in the interaction between ALK fusions and crizotinib, I can simply go to this page and press on the green button to take me out to the database that's reporting that information. And this essentially guides me to the databases that have this information cached. It keeps me from having to cache it all locally. I can just search out um, using these uh, directed tools. Another example of such a database, which is accruing a very large amount of information on mutations, drugs that are being used, and the responses to those drugs, is being sponsored by the American Association for Cancer Research. This is the Genie database, which released just recently information for about 19,000 cancer patients into the public domain, including information about their gene mutations and the drugs that are being used to treat them. Later, because it takes longer, the clinical information that goes along with these patients also will be public, publicly released. And we'll accrue the information from Genie into the civic database that I talked about earlier. So these are building efforts to begin to report this information in accessible websites um, so where uh, physicians and other practitioners can go for information. Lastly, <clears throat> I felt it was so important to share out information in this regard um, that I encouraged and was able to get Cold Spring Harbor Press to initiate a new journal just about over one year ago called Molecular Case Studies. And you'll see that let no good deed go unpunished. I'm now the editor in chief of this journal um, where we're not just cancer focused, but as I'll talk about at the end today, talking about all types of genetic alterations that lead to disease in human beings in a rapid release format where information can be readily disseminated by open source. So I want to spend the rest of my time just talking about a few vignettes about how all of this that I've described can play out in the clinical reality for individual cancer patients. Um, this is an example that from our work is perhaps best known due to large-scale publicity a patient with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. In pediatric patients, ALL is highly curable. About 90% of kids with ALL are cured of their disease. But in adults, it's exactly the opposite. This is a highly fatal disease. And as you can see from the clinical case report of this patient, he has advanced through a bone marrow transplant from his brother to advanced secondary disease that includes a finding of leukemic cells in his cerebral spinal fluid. So this is the equivalent of metastasis, if you will, um, in ALL. And in an effort to help this patient, while he was being treated with a very toxic cocktail of chemotherapies, to which he has not yet, had not yet at the time, developed resistance, 
we initiated a study of his genome and his transcriptome to try and identify any other possibilities for treatment that might lie in the secrets that were being held there. And what we found, just to be brief, in this patient was nothing in the genome that was indicative of any problematic or targetable um, alteration. But it, indeed, in the RNA, we found evidence of extraordinarily high expression of this gene, FLT3, which is a tyrosine kinase well known to be um, implicated in different types of leukemia. And by comparing this to the peer-reviewed literature, as you see here, we were able to identify that he was, for reasons that still are my mysterious, not due to DNA amplification, for example, he was um, overexpressing FLT3 to a very high extent. And this is similar to other patients who are going to develop uh, B-cell ALL. And so what we were able to do, even though it was not a drug at the time or even now that was indicated for the treatment of ALL, uh, indeed it was only at the time approved by the FDA for treatment of renal cell cancer, we were able to get off-label use of this drug sunitinib or sutent for this patient. And as you can see from this graph, um, even at the end of his intensive chemotherapy, which is the middle set of points here on the graph, he had not achieved a complete remission from his secondary disease. But as you can see, during a two-week time course of the Sutent drug, he was able to get into complete remission. This means that he is eligible for a stem cell transplant, which is potentially curative from an unrelated donor, and he was able to receive that transplant in September of 2011. And this patient remains alive and well today. He's been well publicized, as I mentioned, although we have now a peer-reviewed accounting of his tumor studies um, already published in the literature. At the time, um, he was profiled in the New York Times. This is Lucas Wartman, who was one of my colleagues at Washington University. He himself is a hematologic oncologist who treats patients with leukemias. And more recently, this is a picture of Lucas, who was invited by the White House uh, under President Obama to come and celebrate the Precision Medicine Initiative announcement, and this is a picture of him under the seal of the president. In, <clears throat> excuse me, in pediatric brain cancer, we have opportunities as well, and so I'll describe this unique case study to you. But just to point out, children with cancer often experience, if they survive their disease, grave and consequential sequela from the aggressive treatments that they receive. And this is true across the spectrum. And so I think this is one of our greatest opportunities, although pediatric cancer is indeed quite rare, um, to have an impact on reducing the amount of secondary effects in these children. This is a story of a patient with a low-grade glioma diagnosed early on in life at about 18 months of age. The tumor was already sufficiently large and encompassing both sides of the brain to have been removed by surgery, so it was left in place. She came to our attention having uh, taken and failed sequentially about seven chemotherapies, and really there weren't other options available to her at this time. So we were able to receive uh, in, um, <clears throat> a piece of the tumor from a PET active node on the brain and named this case LGG1, low-grade glioma 1. You can see that we've studied this extensively by next-generation sequencing, DNA and RNA. We found a small number of variants, um, but this was really coincident at the time with results coming out of glioma from our studies with um, St. Jude that I mentioned earlier, the Pediatric Cancer Genome Project, and also efforts that were underway in Germany at the DKFZ. And these um, were tied to her findings because she had a very unique BRAF mutation, while these studies were telling us that BRAF, as a mutated gene and also as a fused gene, was becoming very important in, in gliomas. <clears throat> so this just shows the exact um, position and type of mutation that she had, which is a three nucleotide insertion causing an additional amino acid to be placed at the position 601. Now if you know cancer mutations, you know BRAF, B600E, K, et cetera. This is a very frequently mutated hotspot, but typically is a missense mutation, not an additional amino acid being added in as an insertion. And you can see from all of the points of evidence that this was 
in her whole genome, in her exome data, and also being expressed in her RNA, so that we knew that it was a potential driver. What we didn't know at the time of this diagnosis, which was, again, late 2011, was whether this would actually respond to a RAF inhibitor. And because of that uncertainty, the patient initially went on to a MET inhibitor. MET is just downstream from RAF in the pathway-based analysis. But she didn't seem to have much of a response to that. However, sometimes it's about buying enough time for knowledge to improve to the point where you can say, as we were about eight months later, definitively, someone else has been seen with this particular type of BRAF mutation in this position. They received a BRAF inhibitor, and they have responded. And so at that point in time, she transitioned to a second-generation RAF inhibitor. And as you can see, she has continued to hold fast without a progression of her tumor and, in fact, by imaging some evidence of necrosis and diminution of her tumor. Um, so this is medically called stable disease. And while we continue to monitor her through MRI, um, because we're worried about developing acquired resistance, this seems to be a stable case so far. Now, I want to turn my attention just for the last few moments to this new area. I call it looking at genomics with a different lens, um, hearkening back to my microscope analogy. And this is an area that's called now immunogenomics. And this is really not a novel idea. It actually was thought about and hypotheses were pursued back in the late 1980s and early 1990s by a variety of pure immunologists who had observed in mouse models that mice who were growing cancers and had those cancers removed surgically, when rechallenged with the same cancer cells, did not develop cancer a second time. This in intuited that there was some sort of an immunity to the cancer itself. And if you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense. Because there are mutations that introduce changes into the protein sequences of proteins in cancers compared to our normal cells, in some cases, these novel proteins might be highly immunogenic. And in the right setting, we may actually be able to stimulate that person's immune system to mount a new response against the cancer. And so this is really the essence of immunogenomics. Aside from these pioneering works, the idea of immunogenomics has sort of lain fallow, except for the more uh, recent effort shown on this slide in the last few years, again, enabled by next generation sequencing, but also by advanced computational analyses that I'll tell you about that can really interpret these mutations in the context of each patient's immune system to identify those most potent neoantigens, as we call them, or novel tumor-specific peptides that should cause an immune response. And as you can see, this has been a rapidly increasing field of effort. I've stopped my slide here at 2015 because it would explode um, if I went any further. But you get the point. This is really now, um, I think, a new frontier in how we interpret the genomics of the tumor, forgetting about targetable therapies for a moment, really um, thinking about the um, mutational landscape of the patient. So how do we do this with next-gen sequencing? This is a simplified diagram that just shows that we only need small pieces of information. The sequence from the tumor and the normal, just for the genes, because we're focused here on protein coding mutations. The RNA, as I talked about earlier, this tells us which of the mutations we identify are actually being expressed. And in high mutation load tumors, like I will tell you about melanoma in particular, we really need this information to tell us about those suspected neoantigens that are going on to actually be turned into proteins. And then the last component we need, which we can also get from the next generation sequencing data, are the HLA types, both class one and class two, for each patient that we're studying, so that we can then computationally evaluate the potential for binding these neoantigens with the immune molecules in that patient's um, system. So these are really the simple data sets that we require to predict the neoantigens. We first started doing this work in mouse models in a paper um, that was first published in 2012. In 2014, we, followed the, we published a follow-on paper that is shown here where we predicted neoantigens in a carcinogen-induced <laughs> sarcoma model in mouse. So this is a high-mutation load tumor due to the influence of the carcinogen 
methylcholanthrene, or MCA. What we identified in this mouse model were two altered proteins that appeared to be strong neoantigens. We then went on to synthesize those as peptides to study their binding properties to the mouse immune molecules. And finally, as you'll see here, to actually use those modified peptides as a vaccine in mice that were actively growing these tumors from the cell line and enabled them to eradicate the tumors from their bodies. And so this was an important first step, I think, in showing that this type of vaccination with neoantigens could actually be successful. We then forwarded this into a first in human study of patients with melanoma, which was described in Science in early 2015, using the same approach as I've described already by sequencing the tumor, normal DNA, and the RNA, we were able to identify seven neoantigens for each of the three patients described in this study. And to co-opt purified, undifferentiated dendritic cells, which we cultured ex vivo, and then married with the peptides that we had identified for each of these patients to form the vaccine that they received as a series of three infusions at two-week intervals uh, for their cancers. And in this fairly complicated slide, what you can see is the before vaccine and after vaccine results from flow cytometry. These are so-called dextromer assays that basically evaluate before and after vaccination. Is there any evidence that new T cells have been emerging in response to these very specific neoantigenic peptides? And what you can see is that for the three patients illustrated here, before and after, before and after, before and after for this patient, three of the seven peptides were successful in eliciting a novel T cell response, the CD8 positive T cells. Similarly for this patient, and what, what you're looking at in the post-vaccine is this upper right-hand corner in the flow cytometry diagram. So we were able to demonstrate our fundamental hypothesis that this type of vaccination would elicit an immune response and we were also able to show that patients did not have severe adverse events, which is a fairly common occurrence in immunotherapies like checkpoint blockade. The other way we're able to use sequencing nowadays is evaluating the diversity of the T cell receptor before and after vaccine. So for the three examples shown here in the bar graphs, the dark bars are before vaccination, the clear bars are after vaccination, and you can see a marked expansion in the diversity of the T cell repertoire that has occurred as a result of the vaccination. The diversity goes to the potential for long-term um, response to this vaccine, and although in this study we were not evaluating the clinical benefit of the vaccine, I can tell you that of the six patients we vaccine, vaccinated in total in this small study, five remain alive to this day. The sick died of uh, complications from neurosurgery, but not from the vaccination process. We've now uh, continued this into a different tumor type. This is triple negative breast cancer, and I only illustrate this for two purposes. First of all, this is a lower mutation load tumor than melanomas, so now we have to expand out our opportunities for identifying neoantigens beyond simple point mutations to different types of mutations that change the coding frame of the uh, proteins in the cell, and I'll show you an example of that next. Um, and also to illustrate that in this particular de vaccine design setting, we're providing patients this vaccine as part of their primary care for their initial diagnosis. So this is a window of opportunity following a neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation where they receive the vaccine during that time period of up to two years where women with triple negative diagnosis are commonly followed clinically anyway. And so we'll evaluate the tendency to recur in this disease uh, based on these um, parameters. And then the last bullet point just reminds me to tell you that we'll soon be opening a trial in pancreatic cancer to pursue these same types of vaccines. This is just one example of a patient from our study to illustrate that of the neoantigens identified, most are these conventional point mutations that I've already talked about, but you'll see the one at the bottom, which is actually a frame-shifting insertion 
that actually changes the open reading frame of the peptide and may indeed provide a very strong neoantigen. Um, this is subject to interpretation and based on this patient's response. So I'll just finish by introducing the notion of what can we do for those patients with very low mutation loads. So in AML, for example, we know that in the primary disease, the number of mutations is incredibly low, on average about 12 mutations in genes per patient, regardless of the subtype of AML. What we found in this study in 2012 is that if we study the relapse disease, we actually always find a significantly higher number of mutations. And indeed, there's a signature of damage on those mutations from alkylating chemotherapy, which is the standard of care. In other words, we're causing new mutations to occur by virtue of the treatment that we're using for these patients. There's a similar case to this that's been described in gliomas in pediatric patients with the alkylator known as temozolomide, or TMZ, um, which in the green bars for about 35 to 40 percent of patients treated with radiation and temozolomide, the recurrent disease has a markedly increased number of mutations. So while this is a bit depressing, but we've all known this, uh, it may be an opportunity uh, for cancer vaccines because we've now increased the mutational load and we may be able indeed to identify more uh, mutations to create a vaccine. So in an effort to really study this, we've begun to look for specific examples that might instruct us about this possibility. And what you can see here is a story of a recurrent ependymoma, a brain cancer, in this patient that has been identified and continues to recur each time in the same position in the brain. What you can see from the series of bar plots, starting from the very top one, is her mutational landscape for her primary disease. This is followed by a removal and radiation treatment. Her recurrent disease now has a second green subclone that's emerged along with the primary clone, which never went away as a result of the treatment she received. And she receives, again, radiation, but this time coupled with temozolomide, which I just mentioned. Now you'll see this emergent orange clone, probably a result of the temozolomide-initiated damage, and so on, through her uh, fifth re surgery, which is shown at the bottom and was, uh, happened most recently. So two things are obvious. One is we're never curing this patient of her disease. The founder clone in blue continues to come back time after time, but with different versions of subclones that are emerging and, and falling away to the best of our ability to tell with these methods. The second thing is she needs another option to pursue beyond the list of therapies that have been um, already prescribed for her. And so just to finish up with this patient, I will tell you that we have gone on now to identify the potential neoantigens in her tumor, focusing in particular on cluster 1 and cluster 2, which are shown at the top of the um, portion of the figure under C. These are the founder clone and secondary clone mutations that are neoantigens. And in total, we've identified 10 sequences that are being used in a DNA vector um, introduced into her uh, cells to migrate into the brain and hopefully initiate uh, immune response to this tumor. And she's being monitored now for progression. This just happened very recently. So this just um, provides one possibility, and we'll be opening a trial in glioblastoma in adults to pursue similar approaches such as this in adults with recurrent glioblastoma, where temozolomide is the standard of care um, coupled with radiation. So I just want to finish my remarks with a few forward-looking statements about future prospects for genomic medicine. First, there are many needs and challenges. Certainly one slide won't do these all justice, but I tried to pick out a few uh, highlights. First of all, the need for interpreting these mutations that were identified has never been stronger, and we need to continue to emphasize and develop out high-throughput functional genomics so that we can really begin to characterize these different types of mutations and the impact that they have on protein function, protein interactions, and protein substrate binding, among others. This emphasizes a continued importance for model organism research and an opportunity to use the new genome editing tools 
such as talons and CRISPR-Cas, to introduce or remove these mutations to evaluate what their impact is on biology. Second, I would point out that sharing data, even big data, has never been as important as it is now. Um, sharing software and other resources remain critically important, and this is especially true for rare diseases. Indeed, for the medical community, we need to continue to provide training in applied genomics. Where is it appropriate? Where will, will it not help? It's not an answer to everything, but we owe it to our physicians, nurses, genetic counselors, and others to really help them understand this. Um, and this includes the access to web-based information, such as some of the tools that I've described for you today. And then lastly, in the public forum, information is everything. Communicating our results and the impact of genomic medicine, I think, will ensure continued support of governments, hospitals, and taxpayers as we advance in our knowledge and our application of this field. Just a couple of small suggestions in terms of the care for cancer patients. I think one of the emergent and most exciting areas that includes genomics um, is an area called liquid biopsy. This is now being proposed as a much more sensitive mechanism for understanding how patients are or are not responding to their therapies, and indeed is being proposed as an aspect of cancer early detection that we might be moving forward into the clinic in the near future if all of the details can be worked out. So a liquid biopsy commonly refers to the biopsy from blood, looking for circulating free DNA that corresponds to these mutations that we've identified, maybe from an initial sequencing of the tumor, but I think there are other applications in other body fluids um, that go to especially early detection, and we'll see how this sorts out over the years. And then lastly, aside from cancer, I think in pediatric patients in particular, we have an opportunity to really begin to get at very early in life, these alterations, especially in metabolism, as illustrated by this New England Journal paper from the group in Vancouver, that lead later to neural uh, and developmental delay type sequela. So in this retrospective study, 41 patients were evaluated after the fact with very high-level phenotyping and exome sequencing to help identify the defect in their metabolic program. And in some proportion of the cases, very high percentage, almost 70 percent, were diagnosed using the exome sequencing data to identify the exact blockade that was occurring in their metabolic profile. Importantly, about 44 percent of these patients, admittedly small numbers, but this is a start, potentially, had this been known at their birth or shortly thereafter, could have benefited from an intermediate being applied into their diet that would have alleviated or worked around the metabolic block and, in the long run, eliminated or at least reduced some of their neurodevelopmental sequelae. So there, I think there's no stronger argument for doing this at an early point in life when consequences downstream that are very dire could be avoided um, in, in our pediatric patients. And this is something that we're pursuing um, at Nationwide Children's Hospital in the future. So I just want to finish by acknowledging my colleagues, mainly from my former place, um, because I haven't been in Ohio for that long, who contributed to these studies, as well as the um, doctors and researchers at our Siteman Cancer Center who contributed the patient samples. And lastly, to acknowledge the patients and their families for their willingness to participate in these studies, provide their samples, because without samples, I have nothing to do. Um, and I want to thank you all for your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you so much for this presentation, which was very impressive. Thank and you. a lot of hope for every patient, pediatrics, children, and, and adults. Yeah. So uh, we are a little bit late, but if you have any question for Ellen right now, you can raise your hand and you have a microphone. Are there questions? Yes, please. Yes, thank you for your very clear and very impressive presentation. I had a question about the, the cost eff effectiveness of, of these approaches. Uh, it's still very early, but um, at the population wide level, uh, are, are there any data uh, showing what is the uh, cost effectiveness value? Uh, 
So in, in oncology. In particular for oncology, I think that there are um, emerging studies now that are coming from very large numbers of patients that show the cost as well as the clinical benefit for doing these types of evaluations. So I would look for those soon in the peer-reviewed literature. Primarily, two very large programs in the United States that I'm aware of, one at Memorial Sloan Kettering where they now have tested over 12,000 patients using a panel of about 400 genes in an effort to get these patients onto different therapies, primarily through their phase one program. And secondarily, at MD Anderson, our largest cancer center in the United States, now having profiled about 6,000 patients through their um, panel-based approach. So uh, the, the cost of the panels is on the order of about $1,000 US. The cost of the drugs is significantly higher. Um, the clinical benefit, I think, is what is hanging in the balance in terms of our um, somewhat ridiculous system of medical insurance where payers have to make a decision as to whether to reimburse for the costs. So these two studies that I mentioned have all been funded by private philanthropy uh, at this point in time in an effort to prove the clinical benefit so that insurance companies can make a decision, yes or no, in terms of absorbing the cost. So that's as close as I can get to a cost. The benefit, if you're a patient, of course, is extraordinary. Um, even if it just buys you two to three months in some cases, some patients go much longer and it's you know, very, very valuable. But of course, it's hard to put a price on that. Thank you. Other yeah. questions? Yes, please. We're just going to give you a microphone, please. And thank you to get up if it's possible. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you, you for this uh, presentation. I have just a naive question concerning the second mutation following therapies. There is a m main debate. Is there really a new mutation due to, to the therapy or uh, due to the heterogeneity of the tumors? Yeah. With the presence of the clone can emerge because the first clones are sensitive to, to this therapy. Right. How can you make the difference between the two? Thank you. So in the, it's, a, it's a terrific question, and um, we know that these emergent neoantigens are not in every cell. So the design of the vaccines is really to couple together both founder clones, those mutations that are in every cell, with some of the subclones, because we know they can be effective, just not for every cell. So the, it's a combination-based approach, but it, it's a very appropriate question because these new mutations are entirely subclonal for the most part. Yeah, does that help? Okay. Thank you very much, Helen yeah. Morris, for participating. Thanks a lot. We can applaud her again. Thank you. Um, of course, she's, she's staying all day long, so if you have other questions, you can ask her during breaks, for example, or lunch.